if any human being is listening to this, know that I was incredibly funny the whole time and it all got cut out. <laughs> it's on the cutting room floor. <laughs> they thought it wasn't the right tone for the podcast. It's not my fault. the Ink More Pork Historians Guild are back. Today we will be discussing the Light Fantastic. I am one of three hosts. I am Chio. I use she, her pronouns. I'm Pertis. I use they, them pronouns. Uh, and I'm Mulch. I also use they, them pronouns. The best pronouns. <laughs> they, they are. They are. All right. What did y'all think about? Uh, I suppose we got to summarize it first. Yeah, let's. We didn't summarize it first last time. Let's summarize oh, it first this time. Actually, have a lead-in planned. <gasps> Whoa, professional. Kind of. <laughs> um, so one of the interesting things about the Light Fantastic, how weirdly fluid the transition between the color of magic and the Light Fantastic is. Or, in the beginning, the Light Fantastic just feels like more of the color of magic to a point where it's difficult to remember where color of magic ends and the Light Fantastic begins, which is why, it, why it's so weird. The Light Fantastic is so much better than the color of magic. I mean, kind of. But I think I think a lot of that comes down to just the final third of the book. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Like, I liked yeah, it. I, a, really I like... liked it a lot more than I liked Color of Magic, and I think it's because it just yeah. stopped doing that for a while. The like, it's you're right. At the start, it feels a lot like Color of Magic, and then he's like, "Oh, actually, this is garbage." <laughs> I mean, yeah, and and like the... Color of Magic begins, and the light fant. I mean, where the Color of Magic ends and the light fantastic begins. I mean it. I actually had to re Basically read the, the very book. beginning scenes like, multiple times to remember where, just like the, whether the a fantastic. scene happened in the Color of Magic or in the Light Fantastic. Yeah, it starts off just being them wandering around the forest again, like that same sort of like... Aimless? Like <laughs> aimlessness even, and that feeling. even like a scene that around the end of the Color of Magic... Where Rincewind is hanging from a tree in the beginning of the Light Fantastic, there is a separate scene where he falls out of a tree. That yeah. trips me up so much. Yeah. Um, but we didn't summarize the book. Oh, uh, we didn't summarize the book. Uh, <laughs> we said we started with the start of the book, but look, what's what's the summary of the book? Um, there is a um, meteor. There's this giant glowing red star in the sky that the disc is coming nearer and nearer and nearer to. And it has something to do with the one of the eight great spells that is trapped in Rince, that is in Rincewind's head. Mm -hmm. So um, the previous book, the main like, uh, like not adversaries, story but like, What's happening is that the gods are playing a D and D game with their life, lives. Like the the spell is in Rincewind's head. We know it's gonna something's gonna happen with it. Um, the light fantastic is where the the story actually like centers around that spell in Rincewind's head and what's going on with that and what what's happening with the wizards who are trying to figure out like all of this stuff that's that's going on and like how what it has to do with the eight great spells and like what they're supposed to do with that um, <clears throat> um but it, it does just start as a continuation of the light fantastic except you know with without the the gods um it switches over to the the wizards as being the not adversaries what's what's the right word I mean, like you could just say they're DM. the <laughs> antagonist <laughs> Antagonist? Antagonist, yeah, yeah. Dude basically. They're not really the DM because they're not controlling anything. In fact, they're yeah, the really. opposite of in control of what's going on. I mean, the gods yeah, in the well, first not... one are in control of what's going on. They're literally summoning monsters. 
Uh, yeah. Oh, I thought you were talking about the wizards as being DMs, and oh. I was like, what are you talking no, about? No, the DM no. in the second one is the Octavo. Yeah, kind of. But, like, but like, there also is just less of a sense of it being a DM. It's, there's less of a sense of it being a D&D game, part of which I like. Part of the, part of, uh, the reason for that being that it has an actual climax and a finale. Yeah, it feels like it has a more like standard plot structure, I guess. I mean, it's more organized. The final on third every level. is so satisfying. I really, really like the final third of the Light Fantastic. Yeah, it's really good. Mm -hmm. Like the thing that that really caught me is like, even though there are kind of more characters in the Light Fantastic than there were in um, the Color of Magic, I actually know who the fuck they are, and I give a shit about them. Like, even yeah. When because we like actually spend time with them and we engage with their politics and like even and the side ones are doing real world building that matters and not just bullshit except for the druids mm -hmm. who who oh geez the, the, druids, druids. the druids literally felt like they were in, in a book. douglas adams book and then accidentally ended up over here it was yeah not a good douglas adams book like no the juridic stuff was much much weaker than the more sci-fi elements of the color of magic i mean like i feel like it's literally a douglas adams plot point for there to be like druids building a computer out of stones who don't have a concept of just yeah, doing it an it easier doesn't way work it doesn't work it doesn't work very well i mean it does output I still stuff <laughs> i still I mean, like I see where it's concept. going for but it like it doesn't work like it doesn't quite make sense yeah it's a it's for me it's a really great and amusing concept it just doesn't do anything to the story like it's there yeah i don't think it like it's there vaguely it to tell us that the world is off kilter like that the whole world has changed like that's that's really all mm -hmm. they gather from the druids themselves because that's why the computer is not uh -huh. working it's because the whole world has changed so its calculations are messed up yeah, yeah. And I mean, that's good, but the, I don't think the idea of the giant stones being a computer works. Like, I don't think it makes sense inside of the context of the book, and it just feels like... I mean, it feels like nonsense. He literally falls <laughs> into a cloud of rocks just because, like, he said it, and it's, like, unclear if it's a creation i don't it's it's very strange yeah, yeah. Uh, that was the other thing for a second. Like, yeah. going back a little bit to that thing you were talking about about um how you feel like you know the characters better in this i think this book starts to solve the problem you mentioned where all of the like non-human races in the color of magic all felt like felt just like monsters or like non entities. Yeah. Yeah, he, he did do a lot better with all of the fantasy trolls. races feel like people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, we hang out um, with the trolls, which was really nice. Also hang yeah. out with the gnomes. Um one dwarf. Yeah. Uh, um Yeah. I um I did like the how they talked about the like belief system of like um like that that w like what keeps the rock in the air felt felt very terry pratchett i like um, that bit yeah um but then the whole like sacrificial stuff just felt like color of magic it felt like going to i mean i didn't i thought that was also very terry pratchett in its own way Mm -hmm. or his, it, it's a very Terry Pratchett approach to religion and religious ceremony. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's that's true. That's true. Um, yeah, I guess it just fell off to me compared to like the rest of the section with with like like talking to the the uh, druid who's flying the cloud and stuff and like I don't know because I I really liked. I I really liked when uh that section of flying the cloud and then I don't know and then there was the rest and then there was the rest I mean yeah um, it's interesting to be honest for me like the big thing is I just really don't like 
the computer stuff because it's very like it's very obtrusive and it doesn't quite make sense and it just doesn't ah uh, yeah i mean it's some douglas adams shit like it's like it's some fucking douglas adams shit and i love douglas adams that in and of itself is not a problem but it did not feel like something that belonged in this book and it did not feel like mm-hmm. something that had a lot of worth in this book. It felt, again, like a lot of what Color of Magic felt like, which was just like, here's a funny thing I thought up. I'm going to put it in here because, like, fuck it, I guess. Yeah. <clears throat> and, like... that's. I think that's more of a problem in the context of The Light Fantastic because it's overall a much more cohe- tonally cohesive book. Yeah, thank mm-hmm. God. No, I liked uh, the Light Fantastic the, um, a lot, lot more. You know, it felt... In the first two-thirds, I think, had really delightful prose writing. It's a, well, and, ah, and beautiful. For me, for me, Rincewind actually became a character. Like, in, the, in yeah. the Color of Magic, he's just whining all the time. And I don't get a real sense of his, his needs or desires other than I'm scared and I don't want to be. And, like... While that persists to some extent, he, like, has motivations surrounding it. Like, I want to go home. I'm tired of this bullshit. I want to do magic. And I'm so frustrated and angry that my life has been ruined and I can't do magic. And I feel useless. And, like, that works for me. (laughs) That hits. Yeah. Yeah. Where the plot kind of centers around the thing that Rincewind isn't scared of. Yeah. Which is the star. Yeah. 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 Great use the, of that. Like two, Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, two Flowers' whole speech about, like, I'm not worried about this because this is the only thing I've I've seen Rincewind not be afraid of. <laughs> it was really good. Yeah, it was. It was really high quality. And there were some really good parts. Like, I don't want to disparage the early random parts of this book too much because there were, like, the visit to Death's house. Was oh yeah, that was great. It was fun. Oh, I was that really was it, super odd. It was weird, right? It was like, oh, I mean, I guess. And I was then, really interested to see a glimpse of his daughter, just because I know she's coming back in in Mort. So, like, yeah. I'm really, I I was really interested to see that glimpse of her character, yeah. and like, I'm I'm cu- curious about where where that's gonna go in in Mort and in the other Death books. Well, in a way, it doesn't go anywhere. Because Terry Pratchett, when writing Mort, takes one look at that character and goes, no, and just scratches it and completely that's, rewrites her. Like, that's every also fair. aspect of her is different inside of Mort. Uh-huh. I guess, like, kind of a funny thing about uh, Isabel is that she's, like, last of that kind of female character that I remember Terry Pratchett writing. Uh-huh. What do you mean like by that la- kind of team, female character? Well, you know how last time uh, in The Color of Magic we talk about how, like, all of the female characters are kind of, like, sexy and monstrous? Yeah. Outside of The Color of Magic? Yeah, I mean, she's yeah. literally like, you're here, I get to keep you now, right? And it was like, whoa! Yeah. That was a weird yeah. twist. We were playing Bridge a second ago. Like, fuck. Yeah. <laughs> She's the last of that type of female character that I can remember Terry Pratchett writing. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm sure we'll encounter others. Don't worry. <laughs> I Well, I, then I'm interested in seeing I'm how her character sure. changes. I mean, he writes evil female characters in the future, but they're and, never... Yeah. They're never like this anymore. They're never like... They're not needlessly ruthless. I think that's really what it is. It's like... Like the dragon lady, right? Like, just like... Leave. (laughs) Yeah. It's like you do magic. You can just like... Leave, right? Like, you don't have to do this. Or you can... Yeah? Siege the throne a million other ways, right? Like, your brothers are idiots. And they don't (laughs) compare to you. Like, I don't understand why it has to be done like this. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. and Speaking... he has like other ruthless female characters, but it's never this particular combination of like sex appeal and ruthlessness yeah, again. Spe- Speaking of sex appeal and ruthlessness, how'd you had that? Um, what's that adventurer's name? The woman? Uh, Herena? Yeah, how'd she oh, hit it for you? Um, 
didn't she's have a problem. The same. She just, I mean, I guess she, she hit very similar to me than the last few female characters did um, in the first I book. I disagree. Mm -hmm. She sounded like, I guess, a lot more tired. Yeah, she did. did. Yeah, it she wasn't... kind of just seemed like she wanted to do a job. Mm -hmm. But she did have those moments of like unnecessarily, like unnecessary ruthlessness um, that just felt kind of like, I mean, she she felt like she could have been better. And then like, there were just oh, a few points been... where you were like, what? I said, oh yeah, she definitely could have been better. Yeah, I mean, she she felt like she had the potential as a character to be, do better, and then she just made the same kind of decisions that the other, you know. I don't know. She she didn't really hit with me. What about you? What about you? She did not fucking hit for me, y'all. Yeah, <laughs> she really annoyed me. Like it just like I didn't understand why she was there. Like she just mm -hmm. she felt very crowded. Um. Her like, I don't, she she never did anything that really made her stand out to me in any way, and like, her initial description, it like, it felt clear to me that he was like recognizing that he didn't write these characters very well, and like, that she was in a male dominated space and trying to, but then like, but then it's like, oh, and she dresses like some oriental exotica, and it's like, well, actually, I'm not sure. Yeah. Saying that she doesn't dress like that. He was like doing this weird long thing where he was explaining, yeah, she's just wearing practical, dirty clothing. She's filthy all the time because that's what the job entails. Uh, I mean, Herana the Henna Haired Harridan would look quite stunning after a good bath, a heavy duty manicure, and the pick of the leather racks in the Wuhan Lings, Oriental Exotica, and Martial Aids on Hero Street. But yeah, she and that was like cool. Um, I was like, that why, why, why did she put that in, man? I kind of agree that she's unnecessary, though. She is super. Because unnecessary. I keep on, because I keep on forgetting that her section is in this book. Like, uh huh, yeah. It's like <laughs> tell me, tell me what Herena did to move this plot forward. Like. Like she just because she isn't so like needed, you... she isn't needed to chase them because there's literally like eighty schools of magic chasing them. Um, uh huh. She isn't needed to apply that kind of forward story pressure. Any situation that she kind of got them out of, like Cohen was there. It felt so weird to me to put Cohen and Harena in the like same space for even two seconds in this story. Yeah. Forgetting how her section ends, like... <laughs> yeah, what, she just what happened to Lorena? Just... That's the other thing. It's like, yeah, what... Yeah. Um, she just yeah. isn't there anymore. And they, they don't... He doesn't really do anything with her. Um, like, he, he establishes her, her as a character. He just, like, never comes back. Yeah. Um, I did, though, to... To start talking about... Uh, I did, like... Cohen a lot. I love Cohen. In a lot of ways, yeah. Um, and he's like the first um, him in the the what, what's her name? Uh, the the uh, sacrifice? Or yeah. The sacrificial maiden? They felt like actual like members of the party instead of like instead of like uh, Harun did in the first. Like that didn't feel like they were actually like together in things and th these guys felt like you know characters who were part of the part of the group kind of like yeah um i went and double checked how herena left the story because i literally couldn't remember I, I was listing how she left the story but, as we were talking well, I was spacing out. but like she literally gets hit in the back of the head by bethan and then they walk away and that's it oh yeah she never comes back She's not even yeah. mentioned again. That's the last mention of her name in this entire book is Tufara bashing her in the skull 
and then they just leave. Yeah. Beth, Beth and I mean, Dashing like, to school. The only purpose that segment served was to introduce the trolls. Yeah, yeah. That part was the fun. The trolls was fun. Yeah, and her yeah, interaction but like, with the trolls. But again, there were already people in this story. Like, we'll choose one or the other, right? There were all these seers and shit chasing them. And all this Yeah, nonsense. and you could have just... You could have had those, or you could have had just Herena. Because there isn't... we. This is one of the... Like, I know he hasn't decided that like the only real school of magic is the Unseen University that we're going to hear about. Because he does decide that later. He decides uh-huh. that, like, we're just never ever going to talk. There's got to be other schools of magic, but we're going to ignore them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Except, except well, some... I mean, they come back and there's there's another university in uh, Unseen Academicals. Mm, that's in true. Quirm. I, I didn't get to finish that. But yeah. Yeah. But for the but most that's part, the same they don't kind come of up. school. Yeah. You that's like a. a... That the. Uh, that there were supposed to be other schools in the light fantastic. I thought they were just uh, actions within Unseen University itself. I had no. Under- they were. Yeah. Go ahead. I mean, there was like, um, like all the hydrophobic mages and stuff tra- trained in. Um, I mean, they, you know, and they talk about like groups of wizard in wizards in each like, in a bunch of different locations. Um, like the hydrophobic, hydrophobic mages, um, in the place that tried to sacrifice them, they talk about how, like, people have been, like, killing all their wizards and stuff, so, like, it can't just be, like, this one university in this one, in Ink Morpork, because other people are, like, killing off their wizards, and, like, the, the dragon place had a wizard, um, but, like, yeah, he doesn't talk about any of them again. And the one in Quirm is like pops up after Unseen, like as kind of a copy of um, Unseen University. So it's not like it's not like quite the same thing. It's 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 kind of like yeah. But what I was yeah. saying is that I didn't realize. Don't think there were other schools mentioned inside of this book. See, there were, oh yeah, um, if there are different like factions of wizards. Uh-huh. I assume that they were within the university itself, or... Well, but Truman says that the university like we have not sent out. I had understood it as there that the people chasing him were from other schools of magic, or at least other areas oh. of magic. Because See, cause I... Truman is like, hey, why didn't you fucking send anybody out? Everybody else is searching for these guys, but not us. And I had See, understood us to be. I interpreted Truman that act... as. Uh... Because Truman can act independently. I mean, he sends Herena out independently. Yeah, but he does that I... after Weatherwax dies. <laughs> uh, Golder Weatherwax, um, from what I interpreted it as, as. Um, Truman being Golder Weatherwax's second in command, so I assumed by we he meant the two of us, or like the head. I thought there were like different, um, like heads of subjects or whatever. Like Golder Weatherwax um, is the um, was the Arch Chancellor of Unseen University. Um, yeah, I thought he. I thought he was talking about other people in the university too when they when he was talking about other people sending sending people out. But Yeah, that's how I interpret it. Oh well, maybe I'm just fucking confused, so don't worry. Isn't super clear though, so I yeah. don't think No, I mean that's absolutely <laughs> But uh yeah. I I do feel like <laughs> I kind of I'm kind of sad he made the wizard so toothless in later books reading this one. That was one of the things that I really uh-huh. noticed. I was like, man, it's actually fascinating to think about. Like, wizards live two hundred years. You can only up like rank up by killing one another. <laughs> That's like a killer mm-hmm. idea. Yeah, uh, they I mean, they have mentioned it, that explanation for that as they face it as he faces out that what's element. What's the ex- explanation? Oh, uh, he faces out that element around. Um, 
around uh, moving pictures, I think when Arch Chancellor Ridkeley uh, is in, the Arch Chancellor Ridkeley is introduced, and the explanation is that like Ridkeley's too much of a pain in the ass to try and kill. So eventually the wizards are all like, you know what, fuck it, we've got a good thing going on here, why bother? Yeah, I mean, they're just yeah. so different than they were. That's like the several, several volumes in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Moving Pictures is the start of the Industrial Revolution. So. Yeah. Kind of, kind of isn't. Something funny about the Industrial, the quote, Industrial Revolution section is only one book in it centers on actual invention from the Industrial Revolution. Yes. But in the background of all of them, something is happening that pushes forward. Like, I think that that's what he does is like, he just evolves the world secretly. And I think that's very funny. Yeah. Yeah. But it like, always struck me as being less focused on technology and more on civics. I mean, civic the development. Are, the two are really intertwined for me. But uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, you're but right. In a focus the, on one. In you're right. Or in, the other. In, but I mean, but this is what I'm talking about. Like in raising steam, for sure, it's the only one that's actually about the industrial revolution. But in the background, he throws in that there are like hundreds of inventors doing these kind of things and inventing new objects, or like, God, I have not read moving pictures, but in. Uh, fuck the first one going postal he'll mention like new systems for putting out the fires that they haven't worked on before the new systems for instance that are replacing the pumps uh the golems like he'll just push yeah. that in that's what i'm saying is like, it's true that the sorry, books themselves those are civic developments like the fire uh the fire force is made up of people that it's made out of golems civic yeah, who are people? It's, well, they don't. It's a they don't civic. portray that. I think that there are. I mean, they're uh, also not new technology. They've well, the, always the, been but, there. But what I'm saying is, the pumps, the pumps that are replacing them, are. That's what I'm saying. Oh. We will throw in new technologies like that. And they they do go hand in hand exactly. when like like these steps with like these small technological like improvements do go hand in hand with the cis like civic systems that are being improved and changed. Um like it is it is a very interconnected thing. Yeah. Like in uh making money where he invents like technological investment, like being somebody who invests in new technologies to revolutionize things. Uh or when he does things with the clacks uh and going postal. Right. Oh, yeah. Going postal. Clax. I can't wait to talk about the Clax. The Clax is so wild. great. And the best thing he ever put in this. I love it. Was his yeah, I love it was Klax. absolutely his answer to, I don't really want to set many stories outside of Ankhmore Pork. But I do want to have like a whole <laughs> world. And I've accidentally created a world where that's definitely not going to happen. Um, and yeah. It's such a great answer. And the things he does with it are so creative. I'm yeah. really excited. Yeah. I'm really excited to get to that level. Another thing that struck yeah. me as interesting is that this is, I think this is, it's kind of funny to me that this is known as the Discworld series. Is from what I can remember, the Light Fantastic is the first book where the, where the cosmology of the Discworld is important. I mean, of course, it's the first book, it's the second book. Oh, this is the last book oh, where the cosmology oh. of disc, where the fact of the disc world itself is important. Um, oh, that is interesting to think about. What about the fifth elephant? Um, or what? The fifth elephant? Doesn't it come up in the fifth elephant? Fifth. Well, that's all myth, though. That's like none yeah, of that's like, confirmed as being real. I see what you mean. So, like there, and there are multiple books where the myth mythology and the religious elements of the Discworld are important. This is the last book where the physical cosmology is important. Where the physical shape of Atuan 
is actually impactful. Yeah, yeah I think really? it's outside of small mentions, because like sometimes they will mention that Atuin has moved into a region of space, mostly with the auditors. I think we encountered that again. Oh yeah. Oh. God, I love but the you're, auditors. But you're right. Like the primary thing is not that. Like it doesn't matter that much. He's mostly telling very human, very on the ground stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So before we move on to the final third, which I, I love the final third, I am super excited to talk about the final third. I want to I want to bring up what I think is Mike. I think the stuff with my with the gnome is my favorite part of the early part of this book. The gnome in the gingerbread cottage. It's so lovely. You know, I recently <laughs> read, um, which is abroad, so I thought it was super funny. Because um, I had wondered when listening to Which is Abroad, I was like, why is there a gingerbread house? And uh, realizing, uh -huh. getting to figure out why there wasn't a gingerbread, he's like, I already did this one. I don't need to go back. It was really enjoyable. Yes. And I, I found the time with them very nice. I don't feel like it was uh, particularly impactful. My favorite part of the early part was definitely the trees talking and his reaction to the trees talking because it reassured me that like Rincewind is going to be a character. Rincewind is going to be a character yeah. like actually doing things and not just being scared. And I really liked yeah. his reaction of like trees. I love that. I love trees don't talk. Therefore, this tree is not talking because it would be insane for me yeah. to be talking to this tree. <laughs> and how they call back to it several times. Yeah. So, um, even at the god yeah, the like, Even at the god in the like, very, <laughs> Go ahead. In the, go. In the very end when he, when he's like, no, you're not, you're not, go you haven't gone crazy. Even when cre trees, uh, with the spell in your head, even when trees started talking to you, you didn't talk back. That was that was pretty great. Yeah, I, 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 I enjoyed felt, that. I really enjoyed that too. I was about to mention that exact same thing. Yeah, yeah. It was very good. Going, going back to like how it's funny looking at this book and what he proceeded, like what parts of this world he built that he kept and what parts he he left out. It strikes me as being really funny that the tree religion is something that he kept as being a continuous part of the disc world. He kept the tree religion. Where does yes, the tree religion? Yes, it comes come back. back. Where? Where, where is the tree religion? The, I think it's in one of the death books. It's either small gods or um, possibly the thief of time or reaper man. I know it's not. Mm -hmm. the yes, the tree time. religion comes back. I'm so glad it. That does. is so wild. wild to me. I bet it. I bet it's reaper uh -huh. man or small gods because that's within. That's close enough, right? Yeah. Years, right. If if you made the call back yeah. forty years later, it would have been a hell of a move. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's also like r a really fun concept to me: the idea of trees viewing being used as reincarnation. Such a great concept. Yeah. Yeah. I think I love that they're very curious about it. Like they're just like maybe it sounds kind of nice. Like. Is it good when the tree the chest? Uh, talks to the to the luggage and it's like, is it fun being joinery? Yes, that was yeah. fantastic. <laughs> yeah, the idea that Rincewind introduces the concept of boredom to trees. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Oh. No, yeah, that whole section I really enjoyed it. I felt it was. A great exploration of uh, Rincewind for what I felt like was the first time, which is incredible because I read an entire book centered around him. <laughs> Did not feel like he had a character. Um, I was really, really happy to see that. Um, it made me mm -hmm. feel a lot more excited for the book going forward. I think the yeah. finale for this book has like uh, some of the best like Rincewind stuff or like great greater exploration of the ideas behind Rincewind as a character. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I can get behind that. I, I think that it's a great payoff for him in some ways, right? Like, he's not successful. He hasn't really won anything. But he's at home, and he's alive, and he's safe. 
and that feels very satisfying. Um, yeah, in a way that you wouldn't you wouldn't normally expect. Like it's just pleasing that he finally made it back. And that's really what he's wanted this whole time. Like that's that's really been his goals and aspirations. So it's it's nice to see him achieving his his goals <laughs> and aspirations. <laughs> Proud of him. There's this other <laughs> thing where I really love the scene on the top of the tower. Um, where he basically brawls with an eldritch horror. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I found like the ideas, it kind of, I don't think it explored explicitly, but hinted at ideas behind Rincewind. Um, I'm kind of sad that they were never explored in greater detail. Uh, a few of the ideas are um, Rincewind being someone who wants the world to make logical sense, or who yeah. really wants um, there to be like basically logic behind the world. The I... idea that Rincewind was never able to do magic even before the spell simply because he didn't believe in magic. Yeah. And I thought Trumond was such a great contrast to that because both of these men want, yes. like, a, have a desire for order or for reason, but the difference between, like, Trumond and uh, fucking Rincewind is that Trumond is going to make it happen. <laughs> and I think that I think that was such Trumont. a wonderful contrast um, between, like, like, how these desires the first... overpower. Yeah. He's introduced in the way that or he's like explored in the way that Terry Pratchett explores his villain. There is a strong underlying concept behind who Truman is. Mm -hmm. Like the idea that when uh, he says the, the seven of the eight great spells and it tears a hole in his brain yeah. allows the uh, the eldritch beings into into the physical world through his mind it doesn't make him a different person like he still thinks the way that he does it just makes him a more monstrous version of himself yeah mhm mm yeah like, let me no, read I, the I... section because it's such a so incredible. It's going to take me a minute to. <laughs> so you can go on, Mulch. Sorry. Oh, no, no. I I was just thinking. Um, God, it kind of. The like. The like. Um, idea behind like. The monstrosity being. Like very ordered and uncaring kind of reminded me of the it's the uh, wrinkle in time villain the like that whole yeah. section of, of wrinkle in time like like it felt very similar to me but like very con co concise and like well laid out um the idea behind like this monstrous, uncaring, but like or, order, like I, idea of an order, ordered universe. Yeah. Um, damn. No, I, I, I don't know. I really yeah. liked him as a character, and I, I think that the fight scene, um, the idea of just like punching the eldritch horrors which are haunting his body is so very quality. Like, it's so, it's so satisfying that he doesn't beat him mm -hmm. with magic. Like, uh, you know, I had forgotten the end of this book, and I was so vastly worried that it would end with something like that. Because, yeah. Because he's shown that he's not afraid of using deus ex machinas. Literally, the book starts with him magically not uh -huh. dying but from falling over the edge of the world. So clearly, that's like, yeah, that's up for grabs we could do that um uh -huh. it's so satisfying to have 
what I think for me was the only really satisfying fight scene in the whole book, personally. Yes. Because he does yeah, not like a writing. Very satisfying fight scene. He does not like writing fight scenes, and you can really tell. Um, mm -hmm. Throughout this book, like even the simple stuff of like Cohen and Herena going at it, I was like, this is nothing. This is, this is boring. But somehow he got the perfect visceral, satisfying fight between these guys, and it feels messy like it really would be. It feels. Yeah uncomposed it feels fantastic like it feels so good um yeah it was such a great way to have this kind of finale um i think that yeah i think that he kind of calls himself out though for not wanting to do like a really clean ending after that um and i, I while i think that the goodbye to two flower where they're very awkwardly just standing there with each other it works but he's right it makes a less satisfying ending and while i'm all for mm -hmm. books showing uh, a side of reality i i thought it was kind of a cop-out to just say that it isn't going to be a satisfying ending yeah yeah um but overall, anyway can, can i read the description of truman he is it's amazing. I love it. Do it. <laughs> Shoot from the hip. Uh, when Rincewind looks into Truman's eyes and he sees that his eyes, his eyes are described as being empty holes. Um, that strikes me as being really interesting because it's set up earlier in a scene uh, where Truman and Golda Weatherwax are talking and Golda Weatherwax gets into a stare off with Truman and ends up looking down and he describes staring into Truman's eyes as being being the disconcerting sensation of staring into a mirror and seeing nothing there. Yeah. Like, the description of um, Truman, all of the descriptions as Truman the Eldritch all mirror back earlier sequences of uh, just Truman as Truman himself. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, Knowledge speared into Rincewind's mind like a knife of ice. The dungeon dimensions would be a playgroup compared to what thi the things could do in a universe of order. People were craving order and order they would get. The order of the turning screw, the immutable law of straight lines and numbers. They would beg for the harrow. And then, um, there were far worse things than evil. All the demons in hell would torture your very soul but that was precisely because they valued souls very highly. Evil would always try to steal the universe, but at least it considered the universe worth stealing. But the gray world behind those empty eyes would trample and destroy without even according its victims the dignity of hatred. It wouldn't even notice them. That mirrors back to a scene where um, Elder Weatherwax has just died and Truman uh, is now facing down the senior staff of the um, Unseen University. They're trying to figure out why they dislike him so much. And it goes, it wasn't that he was ambitious and cruel. Cruel men were stupid. They all knew how to use cruel, cruel men. They certainly knew how to bend other men's ambition. It wasn't that he was bloodthirsty, power hungry, or especially wicked. These things were not necessarily drawbacks in the wizard. It, it wasn't that he was particularly wise. Every wizard considered himself fairly hot property, wise wise. It wasn't even that he had charisma. They all knew charisma when they encountered it, and Truman had all the charisma of the decade. That was it, in fact. He wasn't good or evil or cruel or extreme in any way but one, which was that he had elevated the grain to the status of fine art and cultivated a mind that it was bleak and pitiless and logical as the slopes of hell. To me, that is intensely satisfying. Yeah. Yeah. Oh God. And it, it really, he really is such a good, like, Her match mind. for Rincewind. Uh, <laughs> like, just because like, it's, it's all the stuff that Rincewind is like, wanting through the duration of the book, but like, horrible <laughs> like Rincewind wants the universe to make sense in 
the way that it does in Truman's mind. Except, you know, not like that at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I also like, I think part of what makes the brawl between Rincewind and Truman so satisfying, the idea that Rincewind has spent the entire last two books absolutely terrified and grows so scared that it just kind of snaps inside of it into a cathartic brawl. Or for the first time ever, something is scared of him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it makes you feel... It's so victorious. It's such a victorious, happy moment. I mean, and he lets it really be that. It's terrifying, and the picture of Truman is a nightmare. But it is still uh, a truly happy moment. And, uh, God, I love it. Like, God. It just it feels so perfect. There's, <laughs> like, this weird scene during the fight where suddenly they flash into the dungeon's dimensions and he's in an, and tr he and Truman are in an arena God, yeah. with like walls with on uh, the theater seats full of like creatures from the dungeon dimension, just watching them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That is real nice. That whole scene. I, yeah. Oh, it felt it felt like peak Terry Pratchett climax. Like I really, it felt familiar to me, and in, in the ways that I've encountered his uh, climaxes, especially with his base, uh, his like more magic based stories, it felt mm -hmm. like a perfect blend of that Terry Pratchett style of like really deep character work and these really, I mean that that the kind of magic that it exists in the Discworlds ongoing is such a, like, reactive, such a very human magic, and it really feels like he finds his pace with that in this book throughout it. I mean, the existence yeah. of the Octavo as a, uh, a group of babbling old people who can't even remember how the world was created. The jokes about... Yeah. I mean, he totally sets aside the gods. They might not have... Ex like, they might as well not have existed. He does so really beautifully. I love the bit where it's like... Uh, the gods didn't know what was going on, but they weren't terribly concerned either because they were in ongoing litigation with the ice giants who had refused to return the lawnmower. Yeah, yeah, they're petty. I mean, he paints, he, he decides to keep them in the world and he addresses that they were there, but they're busy, right? Like, we'll get back to them if we do. Like, he mm -hmm. leaves himself that option, but he makes them way more human. Um, It's... It really feels like he hits a stride. It really feels like he's made the decision like, oh, I have a lot that I want to do with the Discworld. I have things that are creative to tell with this place. Um, mm -hmm. And God, I appreciate that. I think this is also the book where he introduces the idea of the, the, the theater of magic as being an important part of magic. If... Um, Golder Weatherwax's study. He has the giant, like, uh, the giant alligator hanging from the ceiling. He's got a bubbling cauldron of something that turns out to be just uh, water with food coloring and dish soap. Yeah. 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 He starts getting into headology. Yes. Mm -hmm. Or boffo, as he would later call it. Mm, boffo is such a good word. But yeah, absolutely. <laughs> he, he definitely... He definitely falls into that, and he definitely does that with the titles and the way that... Oh, God, it's so wonderful. And where he talks about the uh, right of Ashkenenzi, or Ashkenente. Do you, do you mean where, they summon, death where they summon death? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yes. God, yeah. Where it's very clear that so much of that ritual is just the theatricality. Yeah. Yeah. He talks about how younger wizards discovered that uh, you could do it with just, like, a bit of mouse blood and a um, few sticks, I think it was. Yeah. yeah. But, like, you gotta you gotta go all in, you know, if you're gonna go. I know, and Death, <laughs> and death being like, could you stop doing that? Come on. I was at a party. Yeah, Give he, me a love. Oh. They say three small bits of wood and four cc of mouse blood. 
Yep. Jesus. I also like the death being at a party bit because it's, I think it's um, a sneaky little allusion to the Mask of Red Death. Oh, you know, I didn't even get that. What, what is the Mask oh. of Red Death? A famous Edgar Allan Poe story where um, these uh, rich degenerates throw a party during um pandemic. Oh, Wow. And uh, <laughs> it hits different, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 <laughs> and they think that they've sealed off the pores. And so they've basically been uh, partying for days on end. They're all wearing masks. And at midnight, everyone is supposed to uh, remove their masks. Only it turns out that uh, death is among them. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's about to. Um, one of the wizards asked Death, so how is the party? And he's um, going well, but I think it'll go downhill at midnight. Um, yeah. And somebody asks why, and he said, uh, that's when they think I'm going to remove my mask. Yeah. No, no. It's that. That, yeah. yeah. That's, a good, that's a good hit. I had thought it was just a, a strange reference, like a, a strange joke, I suppose I should say. That's really mm -hmm. um, man. I I and this was the first real appearances of death as death, and it was such like a, a welcome entrance to this character because in the first one he just kind of swears a little and he shows like passive interest, but um, he really you can. In the tell, first book is very like kind of petty and mean spirited. Yeah, yeah. Death a, in the first book feels super out of character. <laughs> Yeah, it's a far cry from the very kindly death we encounter almost all the other time. Because yeah. like, I love I love love so much how Terry Pratchett approaches death as like a kindly figure. It feels um, mm -hmm. very, much more familiar to me. Um and it feels I mean just, right? Like he's he becomes a part of the order of the world. It's not that he wants to kill people, it's that he I mean, it's that he thinks of it as a kindness, and this is the first time that we really see him talk about that and start developing his philosophy about death, which is uh -huh. so fantastic. I mean, it's... Yeah. And to give the little bits of, like, yeah, no, he loves bridge. Like, he loves bridge. He thinks it's fascinating. Yeah. He thinks humans, what humans do are fascinating, and he's going to keep doing it. Like, yes! Yes! <laughs> Yeah, how he views uh, people coming, uh, coming down uh, to, to uh, his house to try and take back souls. Uh, he dislikes that not because he's losing souls, but because he views it as a nuisance <sighs> and rude. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I love that bit. It's so. God, I love Terry Pratchett. After reading The Color of Magic, this was a very happy um, way to remember yeah. why I love these books so much and why I love this writer so much. Like, this had so many <laughs> of... This was what I was hoping for. When we were doing this in chronological style, this is what I was hoping most to see. These early moments where he's really coming into his own. He hasn't fully decided what these things are going to be, but he definitely has the inkling of the idea yet. And now we get to yeah. sit and see how he develops death through these books. I mean, I am fucking <clears throat> thrilled to get to Reaper, Reaper Man, for this mm -hmm. exact reason. It's like, more, sure, I, I'm i very excited for that. But for Reaper, for me, Reaper Man was like, the moment I is interesting. death is like a peaceful character. I, I truly, I like a man who's trying to be, relaxed the guy is fantastic yeah go ahead because it's very clear to me um terry pratchett didn't know he was going to write more when he wrote this mm -hmm. um yeah there's isabel who's a completely different character from who she'll become and then there's also the fact that um while death's playing bridge with the other horsemen of the apocalypse Multiple times they call him Mort, as though that's his first name. Oh yeah, I was wondering about that. He, 
I remember that they did say the name Mort, but I wasn't sure who they were talking to. No, yeah, uh, I think War refers to to death as Mort. The oh, wild. Yeah, I think that I don't agree that he didn't think that he was going to write more of this. I think that there is like a hundred things in this book that are to me clearly lead-ins to other stories that he was leaving mm-hmm. behind. Mm-hmm. Right, like even down to like the very ending, the luggage gets to stick with Rincewind, and it's clear to me that he intends to tell more stories with the luggage and Rincewind. Yeah. Be- yeah. Oh, speaking of the luggage. I love the luggage. Fuck the luggage really. Yeah. Again, uh, the luggage really became a character in this one. And it was yeah. so satisfying. I love Specifically, the luggage is a very very good boy who deserves a lot of human affection. Yes. Yeah. It went from being this weird mean entity who just like bullied Rincewind into being like a fucking dog. Like a smart dog. Yes. And it and he increased the power <laughs> level of the luggage like exponentially. The luggage is literally running through the like house of death and the Oca- octavo, just because oh, yeah, it just, like, wanted a, to. Just, just because, just because it could, yeah. And the reaction it follows its master everywhere. And the reactions, and I mean, that's not even getting into. Fuck! I loved the concept of the star shops, uh-huh. and like, and talking to the star shop guy felt very Terry Pratchett. As oh, well. fun fact about. The Star Shop. This is a book that has two separate alligators hanging from two separate ceilings. Yeah, alligators and crocodiles came up a surprising amount in this book. Yeah. Specifically, dead ones hanging from ceilings. Because there's also an alligator in the octavo. There's a picture of the alligator they talk about. Oh, yeah. No, yeah. Um, Oh, yeah, the the alligator doing some... Doing eggs. Yeah. (laughs) Doing that to like a squid, I think. Having something unthinkable done to it by a squid. Uh, crocodile is mentioned four times, and alligator is mentioned <laughs> one time in this book. <laughs> Which is a lot. Yeah, but that is a lot. This is a lot for okay. a book that did not have a crocodile or an alligator as like a real story Creature. piece. Yeah. Uh, Let's keep talking. I love the Star Shop. I love the Star, star Shop. Pretty great. I loved the Star Shop owner. I love the idea of being cursed and not knowing why the fuck you have to travel the galaxy, <laughs> universes. Yeah. Whatever you want to call it. Um, I like the like multiple expl- explanations for why these shops could be happening, and then, then just the like specific- none of them. specification at the end that none of them are correct. Yeah, even though they all make more sense than what they actually, like, present as the reason. Well, and I think that plays in really well to the desire for order throughout yeah. the book. Like, you'd love to imagine that it works like this, that you could do something like this. But it's not mm-hmm. true. It's way more complicated, and you're not going to get it. Fuck you. Like, that's yeah. killer. Yeah. The kind of irrationality of the world is um, reinforced throughout the books with little asides, like the bit about um, fossils being planted um, in the earth by gods um, to fuck with uh, scientists. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, which is, he returns to that in, like, not just other Discworld books, but, like, like Good Omens. That's a, that's a joke in there that... They're That's they're really it. just a they're just a joke. I think so. it has Something like a ton of jokes like that that come back and forth. Yeah, in other books, uh-huh. because I think the Long Earth actually makes a small reference to something like that as well. Yeah, not and actually, also the bit just the whole series. A bit series. about uh, sailors getting um, ideas from staring at oranges for too long, <laughs> and. Uh, figuring out the hard way that the reason why ships appear as though there's sailing off the edge of the earth is because they are yes uh-huh yeah that was really good um i think i think talking sometimes talking about terry pratchett books is is really peculiar because the best parts of his writing are these like small asides and small jokes and they work because they're incredible character examinations 
of mm -hmm. even like the minorest side character, right? Like I, in the five seconds that we are actually with the star shop guy, I fucking love that dude. Like I'm totally mm -hmm. on his side. I feel bad for him even, but I also can picture him perfectly, right? He is just like that shopkeep who's making his living and doesn't really know why it doesn't really know what he's doing. And he's like at peace or fine with that. Like, all of that feels so perfect. I, I really, really love that kind of thing. And it makes these books kind of hard to talk about too. Because what we're really doing mm -hmm. is like hopping from scene to scene that we loved or we hated. And it's hard to get a full grasp of the book because each of those individual scenes or moments really paint the story together in a way that I think is really yeah. hard to find in other books, even other, like, I want to say comedy focus or, or like, s satirical works. Um, I will note that, like, I think The Color of Magic and The Light Fantastic are, even by Terry Pratchett's standards, exceptionally hard to discuss. Is while well, The Light Fantastic has, like, more of a structure than The Color of Magic does, the first half... The first two thirds are very much just like bouncing from location to location without much by way of structure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, and even uh, still in later parts, he keeps doing that. Yeah. But I'd say like more onwards, books are more like plot driven. Yeah, I think, I think a yeah. lot of his earlier works definitely have more ensemble casts, which... I actually didn't mm -hmm. like, but as he gets older and older, he definitely moves away from that. He will have a cast behind the main character, but he still has one or two primary main characters that are, that's, that's who you're focusing on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, speaking of asides, my favorite aside in the book, I think is with the, um, very elderly wizard uh, who first appears during the rite of Ashkenazi, uh, who death death keeps on shooting not, looks. Not not Ashkenazi. Uh, what is it? Um, Ashkenazi is something else. That's why I'm correcting you. Ashkente. Ashkente, yeah. Um, and how immediately after that he rushes to his study where he has this um he's been working on for decades the safe hole that's designed to keep death out mm -hmm. but then he like for forgets to make air holes in it I thought it was the opposite I thought he made air holes and he'd forgotten that like they would have an impact on this no oh uh, you're right you're right you're right yeah he, he hadn't put air holes in them god what a great <laughs> Yeah. Um, have you guys watched the uh, Lindsay Ellis Loose Cannon video on death? No, absolutely not. It's a really good video. Uh, basically, she talks about the history of the um, personifications of death and explores them, how they're explored in fiction, mm -hmm. what that says about people as a whole. Mm -hmm. To me, this particular scene ties back into the running theme in a lot of these stories, which is the futility of trying to uh, thwart or bargain with or trick death. Mm -hmm. He spent decades making this thing. In the end, none of the runes, none of the um, ceremony, none of the magic actually mattered. Is Death was just there all along. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Death was able to slip past all of those things. And in fact, um, in trying to thwart death, he brought on his own death. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To me, that's very satisfying. I mean, it's very, uh, it's very Grecian, isn't it? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, uh, in preventing the prophecy, you always get it to happen. That kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. It, it yeah. It was very circular and... and pleasant it was such a weird aside at that moment in the book i will say i remember oh, yeah, it's being totally off. unnecessary to i the remember story being well. caught off guard by it well not only is it unnecessary i think it's at a weird spot for it because it's it's really it's an aside 
Like, just like, hey, really quick, we should get back to Grey Old Spald. He's dying. He's dead. <laughs> That's it. And it's like, oh, okay. Like, I loved it. I love seeing death come about, but... I, if... I love watching death come about. I do. Um... I love watching people die. <laughs> <laughs> um... Yeah, and I, I I agree with what you're saying about this being a particularly. Oh. What was that? Are you okay? You did yeah, everything's. Me. Sorry, everything's good. Are you Are you sure? I, yeah, yeah. Sorry, no, that wasn't me. Uh, Umbrella just lost the cat right next to me. Oh. He escaped through the window. Um. <laughs> sorry for the. Is that something that needs to be attended? <laughs> no, no, everything's fine. Okay. We'll just have to do as they please. That's that's not my faith, but go on. I'll worry about anything that does as it pleases. <laughs> well, he was oh. contained. So, go on. Oh. So when I talk about how um, the druids feature a very Terry Pratchett ish approach to religion and another bit that was also very te terry pratchett ish about religion and i think was much more successful mm -hmm. that was the red star people oh my yeah. god yeah yes that I, shit was good that I, shit was really good i a little bit hate him for putting both the star shop and the star people in interaction <laughs> and in the same areas because, mm -hmm. please don't do that to me, sir. Please. <laughs> I'm just a little idiot. And, <laughs> and I can't figure out sometimes who's supposed to be the star people. Um, I solved it by thinking of the star shop as being the wandering shop. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, you really could have come up with any other name for it. I wish he had put it in the book. Because the star shop man, the star merchant, he was talking it. about Why the star people hating him. Someone. And I was like, Why I is it know. called a star shop? That, that that name doesn't even make sense. I think it's a play on starship, maybe. Oh, that oh, would be a very funny joke. That, that's it. That's it. This is book it, has is a it lot of bad jokes. No, that's a good joke. Because it's written as one word, right? Yeah, yeah, I think so. So it probably is. It probably is a play on, on Starship. Mm -hmm. um, which is very, very clever and very funny. Um, but which totally did not hit for me. Mm -hmm. um, I, it didn't hit for me either until you just said it. Um, <laughs> he does describe the shops as being wandering shops at month. I think like earlier before he calls them star shops. For me, that mm -hmm. name stuck in my head, and I forgot that they were even well, ever referred to as star shops. He says the wandering star shops. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. I I do love. I like. I kind of am sad that he doesn't keep doing multiverse stuff. In, like, he does. It comes up a couple of other times, but they're much more apparent and much more direct here than they feel like they are in a lot of his other books. Um, that might yeah. be my own failing of not reading a lot of the Wizards books, because I don't particularly like Rincewind. Um, but, like, holy shit, it's fun to have star shops created by, like, vast galactic empires that now just, like, float around and nobody knows why. That's, like, yeah. fucking killer. Yeah. Um... Actually, um, it does come back, specifically um, in one you haven't read yet, Soul well, yeah. Music. Oh, yeah, that's true. That's true. I haven't read Soul Music. It might yeah. be, I'm looking forward to because it might be my favorite death book. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. I have to reread it. I mean, either that or Reaper Man. Nothing will ever mm -hmm. be Hogfather er, for me. I did love Hogfather, my favorite kid. So we'll 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 have to see. Well, and I got into the Discord because of you. Um, you told me to read Hogfather, and I did, and I loved it. Um, it's it's a great book. It was my first Discworld book, um, that I like really got into. 
um, mm-hmm. and it made me read all of the other ones because it was that fucking good. All of his ideas surrounding mm-hmm. like faith, religion, and gods are like, I mean, that's what I love that Terry Pratchett does the most, um, and I think that he does the most wonderfully. Because they yeah. are such a, a perfect satire of the thing. Uh, the way the priests act and they're like always greedy. It's it's quality. And he references that in these books as well when he's talking about the druids. Um, and, and I think you're absolutely right. It's the most, it's the first time he really gets into like how he satirizes those things. No priest is going to get mm-hmm. up in the morning for a bunch of fucking flowers. Mm-hmm. But, um, going through all uh, of that ceremony just to s- stick his knife in sh- into a bunch of daffodils yeah you need you know the full uh you, you go go hard or go home yeah i mean you gotta it's no fun without let's it. talk about but let's talk about the red star people because i love that shit yeah do the star let's do the star people. let's do the star people and i think it also gets back to where you talk about this is the book where he starts treating death as a more uh, empathetic or human character. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He has that amazing line. Um, Inswind is standing inside of this crowd, listening to this absolutely terrifying speech from one of the star people. And um, he turns to his side and he sees death standing ne- next to him. He says to death, come to gloat and death shrugs and he says i have come to see the future and rinswin says it's horrible and death says i'm inclined to agree rinswin says i would have thought you'd be all for it and death then death gives the speech which is not like this the death of the warrior or the old man or the little child this i understand and i take away the pain and end the suffering I do not understand this death of the mind yeah, I agree. It was, I mean, it's really touching, honestly. I, I love how much pride Death takes in his work in these books. And like, yeah, it really sets him apart. I mean, especially from a British writer, seeing this sort of form of empathetic death, is something you don't see as much. And, and I'm so glad to see in these books, especially, I mean, earlier. Obviously, we had writers like um, China Mieville approach the subject later in British writing, but I feel like at this time, it was it was such a it's it's such a great character. It's such a wonderful thing to do. I mean, you have to imagine, right? Like a man like Terry Pratchett grows up hearing stories about the war, right? London has really only just come out of it, and it wasn't that long ago that they even got off rations. Right? He was born right after, right, right in, um, right after or right in World War Two, and he gets to hear all of these stories and see that destruction as a child, and he gets to decide for himself like what it is to die or to have these these horrible moments, and I think that this is such a great response to that. And to that kind of um, mm-hmm. trauma of his era, this this idea that death gets to take away that pain or gets to give this peace, that he's a kindly man who walks these soldiers to peace. Like, what a fantastic response to that sort of thing. Yeah, no. In an interview, uh, Harry Pratchett um, mentioned, says that um, in an interview that he would get letters from terminally ill people telling him that he, they hoped he had got, um, he had got his ver that he had got it right. And that his version of death is the one that they'll meet. Wow. Um, and apparently after he gets those letters, he spends a lot of time staring at the wall. That's, that's fair. Yeah. But, I mean- yeah. And and it's it work it goes into his later work right because Terry Pratchett himself became terminally ill, and Terry Pratchett started advocating for assisted suicides. It, I mean, he was yeah. in talks about doing one himself, right? I mean, it's such a oh wow, 
yeah, I mean, he couldn't. He he was losing everything, right? He had Alzheimer's. It's one of. Them. I mean, it's a bad way to go, especially for somebody who's a writer. He couldn't yeah. write anymore. Somebody who thinks as much as uh, Terry Pratchett does. He couldn't write anymore. He couldn't um, do his work. I mean, he was a big video game fan, and he even started having trouble doing that. I was recently reading about how he helped develop mods for the game for for. Uh, Oblivion, Elder Scrolls Obl- Oblivion. Um, oh, wow, really? He would send in suggestions to this one um, mod writer, and it was later in his life he was having trouble playing the game. So he did stuff like he asked for the mod was an NPC that would travel with you, and he asked for a mode where the NPC could guide him throughout the world. Because mm-hmm. he just liked to see stuff. Oh, wow. And, and so the the mod maker did it made um made it so the npc could like guide you around and you would follow it and he wrote all these other things and yeah he he wrote topics he produced a documentary that we should watch sometime um oh yeah choosing to die he he made it with the bbc i i think it i mean seeing the beginnings of this character and seeing the beginnings of a kind death and seeing beginnings of death as taking that pain away and not in not in an escapist way either right it's not that death yeah wants to do this he understands that it's a finality but it is yeah it's important it is an important thing to have the end of your life and yeah. to, to do so without pain <laughs> um i think that's i I I mean, what more could be said about Terry Pratchett's death that it hasn't already? There's a reason why this character strikes home so incredibly well. And there's a reason that yeah. Terry Pratchett himself understands this character so well, too. I think death that is it's... probably his most... I think uh, death... Oh, sorry. No, go ahead, go ahead. Oh. I think death is probably uh, Terry Pratchett's most famous and iconic character. Yeah. Most the one that has had the most pop culture uh, icon. I think so yeah. too. With and cultural I, impact. And I think that it's because it's his most philosophically complete character as well. Mm-hmm. Right. You, you can get close with it with Sam Vimes, but there's always a part of, I mean, Sam Vimes is, is not like Terry. <laughs> Right, Terry has met people who are like Sam Vimes, but Death yeah. reflects his philosophy in such an incredible way, and and doesn't stray from it. We only explore that philosophy further, but we never like lose that central tenet of a, a kind death and what it means to be a kind death. Yeah, and what it means to serve the world and and fall in yeah. love with it. I think he explores the concept most fully in Reaper Man. Uh, yeah. Yeah, well, that's what I, I mean, it, yeah. Reaper yeah, Man. Yeah, and I... That is a character I was who, so glad to see books, that in his book. Go ahead, one of you. But not oh. both of you. Uh, Go oh, watch. really quick. I, I, I was uh, just so glad to see that in this book, this second book, just because not having that in the first book was such a like shock it, it was so it felt so bad just because you know that character so well and you love that character so much and he's just not the character he is in the very first book yeah um and like it feels out of character and it feels weird and bad in the first book just because that is such a loved character that like so much has been put into that that character and you know that concept means so much yeah it really does it's also interesting that you bring up that um death is his most philosophically complete character um is in a way of his protagonists he's also the most limited yeah I mean, is of the um of the death books only 
Um, actually, yeah, now that I think about it, only one of them is actually about death. Or and only one of them is death actually the main character. Yeah. The does... rest of them, he, he plays a supporting role. And oftentimes, like, his character arcs are kind of repetitive. Yeah, I like think... he has very similar character arcs in, um, in soul music in uh in the Hog Father. Yeah. Um, and in Reaper. Man. Yeah. He where he oh, just no, takes Reaper breaks. Man is the one. Well, in Reaper Man is the is the one book that I was talking about that is about death. Yeah. The character. I mean, I think that we do explore death in all of this in the Hog Father and in soul music. I, th I think that those are some of his best and most memorable times. Because he appears, I mean, that's the thing about Death, right? He appears in almost every Discworld book. At least, like, a mention. I think I read somewhere that he appears in all of them. Does he fucking really? I bet. So, or, like, I yeah. will take notes of it and see. <laughs> yeah, I guess we could do a count-off. Um, Death has appeared in every Discworld novel with the exception of and this is kind of a surprise. Uh, the Wee Free Men and Snuff. He doesn't and appear snuff? in Snuff. What? Oh, oh, wait. I was thinking Thud for a second. I was like, no. no in Thud, no, he was... super duper appears. Yeah. No, in Snuff, he doesn't yeah, appear, it says. In Snuff, he doesn't. Which is weird, because That's Snuff funny. is a very death-focused book. I mean, it's literally called Snuff. Yeah. Oh, um, that's pretty wild. Yeah, that's really surprising that he doesn't appear in that book. Um, God, I'm excited to get to Snuff. In a year. Um, in a year, yeah. A decade. But yeah, I, it is, I, I absolutely agree. It's, it's really great to see him here as the character that he is. Um, and I absolutely agree that it felt... It felt very, very odd for him to not be that character in the first book like you lose kind of a, a sense of place when you're that familiar with a character and you expect to see him as the one thing yeah yeah I'm not going to lie i didn't really have that problem with the color of magic in part because i didn't read the death books until very recently and also in part because i read the color of magic at a very very young age Mm -hmm. So to me, it's a very familiar version of death, even though now looking at it within the context of the greater Discworld, it's also like an off version. Yeah. Off model. Yeah. Off model. God, such a rough model. Is there, is there anything uh. else we'd like to say about the Light Fantastic? Yes. I want... Uh, <laughs> um, so what's it? What are the names? Conan and Bethan? Yes. Um, I want to talk more about them for a little bit because that's true. One, I could talk about them forever. Yes. Um, one, I think there's just more, uh, there. Like, uh, Conan comes back, doesn't doesn't he in later yes, Rincewind books? Does. Yeah, I, I haven't read any of those, but um, I am now very excited for that. Um, but also, what what did you guys think about the marriage? <laughs> the fact that they're getting married. Because <laughs> um, that was a little bit rough for me. Like, I liked these characters a super lot, but I was also, like, a Look, little... It was weird um, to me that he suggested that they get married. Because, like... There, there wasn't, there isn't a need, right? They, they, they're not, they're not in what we would, they, they're never shown doing what we would traditionally call, like, love. Like, they're not romantic, yeah. but they, they are yeah. doing a service for each other. And there's no reason that they need to be married to do that or to advance that. And so that was, yeah. that was a little harsh. That was a little harsh yeah. around the edges. The idea that they're getting married, um... And that she is 17? 
and that he yeah. is eighty-seven. Yeah. Because he says that was... earlier, if I was twenty years younger, I'd be sixty-seven or something like that. Yeah. And that, yeah. Would, that would be rough for me. That and there's this does not the. Whew. It's also one of those weird things where nearly every Terry Pratchett, where nearly every Discworld book from starting from here has a romantic plot line or a romantic subplot, whether or not it works. Mm -hmm. Very nearly every book. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of them. Like, yeah, I've definitely noticed that before. Like, I think it was the worst in, um, I remember reading Going Postal and thinking to myself, like, why the fuck is there a romance here? Like, this is not mm -hmm. necessary. It does not advance the story in any way, shape, or form. But I guess. And I would then... not have picked up Going Postal as an example of uh, a romantic plotline not working out of all of, like, the Discworld books. That one, for me, does not fucking work. Um, we will get to going postal, and I will express strongly my feelings in regards to their relationship. Huh. Because it is like... Is for, awesome. for me, Odd. For me, it's really, it really stands out as like a almost like fetishistic relationship. Like, it's, it's, it's so... They don't match together. They don't... It doesn't work for me in any way, shape, or form. We will get to it. God, we yeah. will get to it. It is the I'll only be, part oh, of Going Postal I'm, I'm that I really, for... really don't like. Huh. See, the ones I would have picked out as being example of uh, stories where the romantic subplot does not work at all, I'd pick out um, Equal Rights as being a big example of one. Well, uh, I haven't read Equal Rights. Tiffany, <laughs> Tiffany Aching books. Um, oh. I haven't read Shepherd's Crown, but all of the other ones have romantic plot lines that feel weird as fuck and don't work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we what does we for at least in like going postal, both of the characters are good. I mean, I'm glad that both of the characters are like adults. Yeah, I guess like that helps. Yeah. <laughs> and she like, is. A, you're um, right. She is a good character, but I think it's precisely because but, she's a good character that it makes me angrier. And, like, it's going, the thing about the romance and going postal is that there's, I don't know how to say that because I always say it like an uncomfortable feeling of gender, but I don't know if that makes any sense I mean, in what I'm trying to she, express. Like, he's just... I mean, it makes sense. There's a lot of, I'm not super comfortable with a lot of the gender in Terry Pratchett books. Yeah, I mean, let's... I say a lot of the gender when what I mean is gender dynamics. Uh, yeah. <laughs> But I mean, I sometimes there is a works. lot of gender. Um, I mean, if we're going to talk about... I'm going to say this thing about Going Postal because you made me think about it because it makes me so furious. Because it literally, the book spends so much time building her up as, like, strong and independent and, like, extraordinarily, full, like, herself. And then she's literally a prize for winning a race. Yeah. Literally. Um, okay, yeah. we should probably drift away from going postal. Uh, even though the relationship in that is a lot more interesting than the one here between Cohen and Bethan. Yeah. Like, I guess that's like... I mean, beyond just... the obvious discomfort of the massive age gap, I think that's my main problem with relationship between Cohen and Bethan, which is just, it's just not interesting to me at all. I think it would have yeah. been more interesting if they weren't getting married, because, <laughs> like, I think that there's things that you can say about, like, I'm, like, I'm just trying to find a spot in the world where I can be useful and be safe, because you guys fucking ruined my life, and, like, if that's hanging out with this old guy, that works for me, and that makes me happy. There is like yeah, absolutely, better, and I, uh, there's absolutely things to say about that versus, well, I'm 17. I guess I'll get married to this 87 year old. Like, oh, don't say that. <laughs> don't say that also, thing. And it's also a relationship with that could have had like a lot more potential in the long term. Because after this book, Bethan never shows up. I was about to say, I know for a fact yeah, I, Bethan isn't with Cohen later. 
Yeah, and I feel like in later books, Bethan could have been there if it wasn't a romantic relationship. Yeah, yeah if they, if they hadn't fucking got married. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, and I don't understand it at all. Just because none of their dynamic is ever romantic. Like, it is in service, like, but it, it is not romantic. Yeah. It. <laughs> There's this other thing where, like, I think Terry Pratchett liked the idea of Bethan. He liked the idea of somebody who's been looking, who's been living their entire life looking forward to being a human sacrifice has like high hopes for it if he actually brings up a character like he he does gives bethan another go under a different name in like pyramids i think yeah i mean i think that a person who suddenly does not have a purpose um is something that he revisits a lot and i think he does it a lot mm -hmm. with um women characters and I'm glad he does, because this is yeah. bad. <laughs> yeah, but, like, yeah. very specifically Bethan. Because I remember the female lead in Pyramids is, like, a celestial virgin, I think. Or somebody who is all, like, yes, I am a virgin, and I'm going to be killed. And this is my purpose for life, and I'm really looking forward to it, because the afterlife is going to be great. Hmm. Uh-huh. Yeah, I, I do I do wish he'd done more with Bethan in this book because it kind of felt like he was starting to, right? Bethan starts being much more strong willed and starts taking charge of situations. Um and I think that there were things to be said there about making Cohen softer and her more fierce um in their interactions. But then they're getting married and it's a total write off and Cohen literally disappears. And, yeah, and, and it's we not... never actually see them get married. We just, well, I like, assume they don't. At the, end, two flowers, <laughs> at, at the end, Two Flower is looking for Bethan and Cohen because he wants to give them this sack of money as a wedding present. Well, Cohen he did... asks Two Flower where they are. I mean, he asks Rincewind where they are, and Rincewind's all like, I don't know, off doing stuff together, I guess. Cohen didn't make it to Ankhmore Pork itself, right? Oh, he did. No, he, did. He, he, wrote did. The, he wrote the luggage. And he got to the university. Right, yeah, right, right. Literally yeah. at the end, he was like, aha, I wrote in. And you're like, oh. Yes, yes. Time to save you from this, from slipping off the edge. Yes, yes. He literally rides in at the last that... second to save him from the edge. It is, the, it is insane. Yeah. Something that makes me kind of sad is Hammerhawk, the dwarf who is also writing the luggage, and we never hear about him after, like... Yeah, I kind of... I, I liked him, too. That's true. <sighs> yeah. Yeah, there was a lot of potential in this book. I think he delivered on some of it, and I think that there were some big fucking misses. I mean, there are so many characters that he just dropped that I wanted to see more of, or things yeah. between characters that he made a little whack like this 17 and 87 yeah. year old becoming engaged getting married i like yeah. how scary it was like specifically i think the bit with the star people is the first really scary bit yeah this girl so far. unnerving very weird mm -hmm. how yeah. like brutal it is yeah, and um, Rincewind is being mobbed, and they bring. He says, "Look, if I were a wizard, I, I would be doing magic right now, and uh, you'd all be sorry." And they'd be. They were like, "Yeah, we killed all of our wizards." Yeah, yeah. And I think that's the first like where he starts to approach the concept of like. I don't know the the concept of like ordinary people doing like becoming a terrible mass like because he does that a lot in his books. Yeah, um, he is very like, interested kind of like, in the psychology of crowds. Yes, yeah. yeah, and this is like his first approach at that. And I I think it works really well. I mean, it's it's something that Terry Pratchett is loved for, right? 
he the person versus people arguments that he makes all the time, especially yeah. in every watch book ever. Yeah. Um Yeah, I think it, he does really well with it. And it is unnerving and it is terrifying. Mm. And it's what I liked about it is that it doesn't feel the star people don't feel necessarily unreasonable as a thing to exist which i think is a very hard mm -hmm. line to roll with something as intense as like a cult killing people cult. yeah apocalyptic death cult apocalyptic death cult killing people is like they don't feel unfair like if if a giant star was crashing into the planet i don't know what i'd do probably not kill people but i like, would not be surprised speed. to see them like it's having an actual yeah. effect on the temperature of the earth and it's getting bigger every day yeah exactly right like it like, feels very if you're reasonable. gonna make a death cult like that's when you'd make a death cult that's when they're, that's when you have a death cult like if we're gonna have a death cult it's when the red star is coming i i've listened earth to the david bowie eight. songs i know what's happening world yeah. does not work the way that it is supposed to be supposed to the disc world is very fairly established in the beginning as something where the act where the gods play an active role um you insult the god of lightning you get struck by lightning <laughs> suddenly that's not a thing anymore yeah they've like they vandalized churches of very powerful gods and yet nothing has happened yeah. um yeah. wizards can't do magic anymore because um is the turtle has moved into a place where uh magic is weak in the universe but they don't know that they just know that suddenly things don't work yeah things have gone yeah. a little whack fuck it's so good all right we should uh we should finish up yeah. Okay. Uh, before we finish up, I I want to talk about the turtle itself and the finale. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's talk about Atui. Is that was such an amazing scene, and it's sort of like, so the idea that in a way the star was never a threat at all, as terrifying as it was, the star yeah. is light, not death. Yeah. Yeah. I love like, that. And that's that's the scene. Yeah, that, that scene, uh, you know, I read this book very young, and that's the one scene that really stuck with me, is that, that image of the baby turtles hatching in the sky, and just, like, the scale of that, and, like, that's, like, the one scene that all, like, has stuck with me to adulthood, just from reading it once as a kid. I also See, for me, it was the opposite. Like, when I read it, it went right over my head. I did not understand the ending of the of the Light Fantastic at all when I was little. It's a really small part yeah. of the book, really, that ending for how... For it being the, the climax, for the absolute finale. It's just like... It's a, like a page of description. And then it's like, yeah. Then we're yeah. <laughs> and I thought that was mm -hmm. such a great sign-off. I love so much that in relation to Atu and the impetus of the story is actually stopping humanity from fucking it up, right? Like, it's not dangerous. But the Octavo yeah. knows that you, like, everyone's going to fuck it up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's not a concern, but we had to do all of this shit and we had to have two books of adventure to make sure nothing happened. Yeah. Yes. God, it's like the whole the whole point of the wizards later on is to not do magic. The hardest well, thing to do is to not do magic. We just went on a huge quest to end up here not doing magic. Yeah. Yeah. It's like that is so fantastic. And it's very British to write a whole book about doing nothing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um I, I, I thought that was and really I good. Don't like how how it's built up to the finale and how we gradually get more and more information as the story progresses, sort of seeded in very subtly. Yeah. In the beginning, they're talking about Greta Tuin and uh, he says, actually, the scientists have it wrong. Greta Tuin is having a great time. Uh, 
is it's the only one that knows where it's going. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I also love how we get slipped information about Atu and himself. Uh, stuff like that. Herself. But herself. My apologies. You're so right. Uh, <laughs> mis- misgendered the chrono turtle. Uh, uh, whatever Astro-Tolonian. the fuck they call it. Yes, Astro Chelonian. Like That's what I was trying to come up with. Um, I love how we're drip fed information about Atu. And, and it's something that happens later in the books, too. Like, you said cosmology doesn't really come up, and you're absolutely right. It's almost never relevant to the story. But Terry Pratchett clearly loves Atuin as like a, a gentle character. Because he will often yeah. Yeah. mention at the beginnings of books or in random places that Atuin is a certain way or is thinking a certain thing or is doing X. And I, I think it's it's really incredible. I loved the idea of how he built up the scale of Atuin by drip-feeding information. Um, like when he's talking about um, the wizards having listened to him for like 30 years <laughs> constantly decoding and they just figured out he's or she's going towards something. Like, that's killer. <laughs> <laughs> that That's yeah. such a cool way of building up the scale of this creature. Because we can't. We're humans. Yeah. We can't think of something so vastly large as that. I, yeah, it made the thing the about the feel eggs, really great orbiting yeah. the star, like bigger than moons, or bigger than the disc's moon, individually. Yeah. Oh, fuck! It's good. Also, I comments that um, this is an area of thin magic. And if the Great Atuin spends too much time here, the, uh, the disc will gradually be eroded by reality. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That was such an interesting touch. I, I love how he yeah. mentions that. That's always something that he keeps. That it's at the end of... He doesn't call it a probability curve after a certain amount of time, but it's the same thing. It's at the edge of re- like where reality would be, and that's how all this shit happens. Oh, yeah. Good. good. All right. Final, final. Let's go over final. Final thoughts. Thoughts. And, yeah. Final thoughts. Tell me how. Tell me how Light Fantastic hits. Oh yeah, and we need to rank it on our That's list of two. Very easily, right now. <laughs> so on our list of two, the Light Fantastic is better than the Color of Magic. I know that this is a controversial take yeah, I'm making here. Is there that's... even a moat of disagreement on that point? <laughs> yeah. Do we all have separate lists or are we trying to make a single list? We have to make a single list. We have to agree on placement. Yeah. I, that's I would be inclined to disagree because I think that'll take a lot of time. Oh, oh, will reading all 41 of these books and ranking them take a long time? I mean, yeah, I think we got to make a single list just for this. Clip, like, we can... Clip three. I think at some point... Um, because here the, here's the thing. I think it'll be very quick for us each individually to rank an item on our own personal lists. I think it'll take more than half the episode if we have to try and make a large list. As I said in the first a, episode, a our episodes are just going to get progressively longer and longer. As we categorize and rank um, 20 plus books. Yeah. There's longer and then there's longer. If you get my drift. (laughs) All right. We can Um, create individual lists to prevent a five hour episode. But if a human being does listen to this and does desire the five hour episodes, I think we should, I think we should comply. Okay, so we're basically putting ourselves at the mercy of uh, listener feedback. Uh, uh, yes, I'm, I'm mostly cool because I think yeah. my idea uh, has merit, but I, I don't want to argue. I think it also has. I I do think it has merit. I assumed um, I assumed we would be doing just one list together. See, um. I think one list together is uh, more entertaining. 
because it's I think you're I think you're abs I think you're absolutely right. Our individual lists are very easy to sort. But it's a group list that's really strong. Yes, mm -hmm. but also functionally useless yeah. because it's such a comp compromised creation. Um, I, I hate to tell you this, but a ranked list of every Discworld book is functionally useless no matter what. Yeah, but at least if they're individual lists, they are representative of an individual opinion. But this could be representative of a podcast opinion. Which is worse than an individual She's opinion. Useless. <laughs> I but I have to reiterate the original one is useless too. The original list has a utility. It's just individual list has a utility. It's just a very, very limited one. You're right. If I ever want to go back and think to myself, what is my third favorite Discworld book? Then it will be useful. Yes, and also well, it is a representative <laughs> of an individual's it's, taste, which is that it says something about the individual makes it. Okay, but if we're... The only reason to... I mean, if we're doing this on a podcast, if we're presenting a list on a podcast, it only makes sense to present a list that's from all of us. Like, yeah. uh, I mean, we can all have personal lists, but, like, if we're deciding at the end of each episode, where to put it on the list. We're, it has to be something we're deciding together to put on one list. Like that's that's the only thing that makes sense from a podcast perspective. Hmm, there is some merit to that. I agree. I want to do a thing where we each cape, where after we finish a book, we make a, um, we rank it on our list of favorites, but we don't really bring that up until the final episode. Or then we can bring up our individual lists and then see how how widely they um, differ from the group podcast list. I mean, I think what that will do is create 41 episodes where we're gently talking about a book and then one episode where we just fucking hack at each other for Oh, no, no. Uh, I'm hours. saying it the other way around, where we talk about the one group list in the podcast episode. Oh, I see. We have a separate personal list that we don't really talk about. I see. So we will come up with one together, and we will we'll have a, a discussion about our individuals. Yes. I see. I okay. see. I see. That works for me. Yeah, that's, that sounds good. Oh man, every episode we're ha going to have a segment where we discuss the podcast itself. Uh, yes. Speaking, yes. Yeah. Well, yeah, I will probably cut it out. I'm sorry, guys. No, leave it no, in, you should keep in media in. res. Let's go. Okay. Don't sanitize um, us. Okay. Don't sanitize us. Don't make me family friendly. I think this is useful informa information for the audience. Because it means we don't have to, like, explain it again. Yeah, just leave it in. Leave it a little messy. I don't know if you guys have heard your mics, but I think I think it's okay if we're a little messy. <laughs> oh, okay, rude. Let's, let's do the final, let's, let's do the final impressions. The episode, I think this episode, we have a consensus on where this lands on the group list. Yeah, none of us have gotten a lobotomy, so this one's easy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, final thoughts. Overall, Life Fantastic is 100 times better than Color of Magic, but still had some major flaws that really held it back from me feeling like it was a great Discworld book. I still think it stands head and shoulders <laughs> above 100 other books I've read. And it really goes to show Terry Pratchett's yeah. ability and creativity that it is so pleasant to read i like yeah i i felt so much better about this one than the color of magic i was actually excited to visit it um and it felt mm -hmm. like being transported into another world fantastic work yeah um i can go next uh <laughs> um i did like genuinely enjoy reading this one it's definitely not one of my favorite terry pratchett books it's still a very early book 
Um, and I didn't enjoy reading it as much as I enjoy reading my favorite Terry Pratchett books. But it was it was very enjoyable. There are moments in it that, uh, like I was saying, that like I read as a child and still remember as an adult, and like because they just stuck with me so well. And like that's that's like like when I was reading color of magic i couldn't remember hardly anything but when i was reading like fantastic i kept on coming on along these moments and i was like oh yeah i i remember that from when i was a kid i remember that that was really enjoyable to read when i was a kid and it still is um i thought the characters were better and i thought just overall it, it was a tighter book it it made more sense um yeah that's that's like fantastic for me I really liked The Light Fantastic. It's kind of funny because I've been almost talking, I've been talking The Light Fantastic up this entire episode, just talking about how much I enjoy it. Funny thing is I still think it's going to end up on the lower end of the list of just all the Discworld books because I like all of the Discworld books a lot. I thought this one had really <laughs> satisfying prose writing. Like Terry Pratchett, the wizard with analogies. Nobody knows how mm -hmm. to work a metaphor like Terry Pratchett. Just so delightful. And I love the final third of the book. I thought it was really tight, really satisfying. And I, I think um, this is the best character stuff that Rincewind ever gets. That's and, rough, but go on. <laughs> Um, I didn't like the, um, first two thirds of the book as much. Well, I thought it was still enjoyable because again, the prose writing is fantastic. Um, I don't think it really clicked into place until the final third. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's it. That's a wrap. That's a wrap folks. All right, you know? this is real now. This is this was a bit, but now it's real. If I'm not funny, it's because it's on the cutting room floor. If I'm not enjoyable, if I'm not relatable to the masses, it's because it's on the cutting room floor. Don't look at me. I'm incredibly funny and relatable. Uh, uh, Michi, Michi, confirm that I. Oh, did you did you come back? I don't think she's there. Was back. like sound. Oh, okay. Oh. Okay, yeah, Con confirm uh, that I took all references of cocaine out of uh, the first recording. <laughs>